Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. You're watching Newcastle Fast FM. This is the Late Show Live, as we are every evening uh, during the month of Ramadan. This is a program where we have different guests coming on every night um, throughout this blessed month. Uh, and there's been so many different topics that we've talked about based upon people's different interests, different specialities, and all of that sort of stuff. So uh, let me introduce uh, my co-host, first of all, Brother Jamal. Salaam alaikum. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi How's everyone doing? Hope you're well, inshallah. Alhamdulillah, we're well, well, man. You missed a couple of good sessions, you know? I did, yeah. Well, I think actually last night I missed. I was there the night before. Yeah, last night. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 But it was, um, it was it was good catching up with brother Umar again after such a long time, you know. Yeah, I saw a little bit. Umar from Scotland. Yeah, alhamdulillah. Miss him. I haven't seen him for a long time. Yeah, yeah, it's been a while. Alhamdulillah. He's doing good though. He we had a good conversation about Islam, Dawah in Scotland, and loads of other stuff. Yeah, lots of, you know, almost like lots of banter, yeah. Yeah. yeah oh. <laughs> <laughs> um, so tonight we have um uh, another special guest. It's going to be very interesting tonight's program. Uh, I've got a lot of questions. I got a lot of questions for this brother right here. So let's let's go straight into it. Uh, yeah, brother Robert Dufour. Is, did I pronounce that right? Uh, Dufour. Yeah, that, that's fine. Yeah. Dufour. Dufour. Yeah, it's French. All right. Yeah. All right, brother Robert. Salam alaikum. How are you doing? Wa alaikum salam. I'm doing very well. Uh, hopefully, you guys are having a blessed Ramadan. Inshallah. Uh, but uh, yeah, we're doing well here. It's a nice, cool month. Uh, the days are getting shorter, and uh, you know, like it's a kind of a silver lining that uh, we're all at, all at home because uh, to uh, reestablish our relationship with uh, with Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala. Absolutely, and you know, it's it's one of the things where you know every year we say this that the month has gone so quickly. We're at the last 10, 10 nights, guys. Yeah, this is. Uh, the last 10 blessed nights of Ramadan. And it seems to have gone really, I don't know about you guys, but for me, it seems to have gone really, really quickly. You know, it's one of those things. Every year we get the same thing. Yeah. SubhanAllah. Wow. Um, okay, so Robert, tell us, obviously you're from Canada. You're from, um, I guess, French-speaking Canada, are you? No, English-speaking Canada. I'm from Ontario, uh, from a city just outside Windsor called Amherstburg. It's about 20,000 people. Um, I actually relearned French after I became Muslim. So, Subhanallah. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm the only person in my family that speaks French. Like my, all my ancestors, they all re-acculturated re to the, uh, to English. So, uh, yeah. Uh, but yeah, no, I'm from English speaking Canada. But your ancestry is uh, French though. French European came to Canada. Yeah, I'm a mixture of different uh, European backgrounds. My 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 father's French Canadian. Uh, my mom's uh, from the states, but she is um, she is uh, Polish, Armenian, so like Eastern European. So that's why I have darker features than, than other white guys. <laughs> <laughs> okay, alhamdulillah. So tell us a little bit about yourself, Robert. Tell us a little bit about your background prior to Islam, uh, coming to Islam. Tell us a little bit about yourself. Yeah, so uh, I grew up in a small town, like I said, um, you know, like um, pretty st standard family, uh, you know, like, you know, pretty uh, supportive of me and everything. I was very lazy. Uh, I uh, you know, was living at home uh, for a long time and only working uh, part time at a pizza place. It was actually run by Muslims. Uh, they weren't practicing. It was run by Muslims. Um, so my life really wasn't going anywhere. Um, and then, um, after nine 11 happened, I started to really get into like, um, politics and, uh, conspiracy theories specifically. <laughs> so I would look up conspiracy theories on the internet because it had a very inquisitive mind. And I, you know, didn't really buy what the media was selling me. Um, and, uh, that sort of led me to Islam in a way. I didn't really know much about it. Other than uh, I think I watched uh, Malcolm X, uh, the movie, a couple of times. And uh, we had a field trip to the mosque uh, once in high school. Um, but, um, you know, my interest was piqued uh, because I was, you know, looking into different things in the world. And uh, one day I decided to type up Islam on the Internet. And the first website I came to had a picture of the unborn baby in the mother's womb. And I'm like, what does this have to do with Islam? Do I have the right website? And did I click the wrong link or something? 
And uh, yeah, it talked about how, you know, like uh, the Quran uh, contains uh, scientific information that they only know with the technology of the 20th century. And mm. it just blew my mind. It was like, there's no way a human being could write a book like this. Um, so I read Surat al-Baqarah in like one night. Um, and then I studied Islam on my own for like about eight, nine months. Um, and then, uh, yeah, one uh, Ramadan, I just decided to go to the mosque. Finally worked up the courage to uh, go there. And uh, ended up taking my shahada that day. Um, Inshallah. Yeah, yeah. So a week later, I told my family, and alhamdulillah, they uh, had no problem with it. So I was one of the lucky ones. But uh, yeah, so uh, then years years gone by. It took a while for me to like um, finally get my life back together and actually learn a skill, <laughs> get a career and everything. But um, yeah, that's, that's pretty much it. Yeah, so. Okay, alhamdulillah. I mean, that's an interesting story. It's interesting for a number of reasons because the build-up to it, you know, working with Muslims, whether they're practicing or not, but working with Muslims and then 9-11. And you, you know what? This You're not the first person that I've heard who um, got their interest about Islam due to September the 11th. There's a number of converts who went through that, reverts, they went through that sort of phase and opened up that discussion for them, I guess, opened up that interest for them to learn more about the religion of Islam and that inquisitive mind is exactly you know what Allah tells us in the Quran about the one who is a truth seeker the one who sincerely looks for the truth Allah will guide that person to the truth so there's a number of things uh, which is interesting from that um, and then obviously you found your way through studying through reading researching and then you accepted the truth of Islam which is which is amazing subhanallah and may Allah accept it from you yeah, subhanAllah, yeah. may Allah accept it from all of us. I'm uh, very lucky, you know, like the only convert basically in my whole town. Uh, so I feel like I have like a special responsibility to, to those people uh, to try Absolutely. to be the best person you can be. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, you know, like you tell people some of these miracles and, uh, you know, some people are just like, wow, that's pretty impressive. The others try to mm. explain it away and, you know, like... Um, you know, at the end of the day, you know, the guidance is up to a loss. So, I mean, mm. it's, it's, it's inevitable. That's a simple, yeah, that's basically what it comes down to. Yeah. What I wanted to ask um, actually was, so your, your Muslim employer, um, at the time you're working for them, did they ever give you dawa? Uh, not really. Um, like their, like their, their adab was good. Like they're very generous, uh, hardworking. Um, you know, I, <laughs> they really whipped me into shape. I was a really lazy kid. So like I had to learn the ropes really fast and everything. So I did learn a lot from them and they had one of, one of their friends was a practicing Muslim as well. So, um, even though, you know, they weren't, uh, practicing Muslims, uh, um, you know, like, uh, you know, the very least, like, you know, there's still that, you know, that, uh, you know, that culture of generosity and, and, uh, you know, and hard work and, and, and things like that, that, um, yeah, that sort of uh, point you in the right direction. But um, yeah, I know this is a completely independent project on my part. I didn't even tell them that I was studying Islam until after I converted. So, Mashallah. And uh, Jamal, you know, obviously, um, you took your shahada pre Islam, pre nine eleven, though, right? So yeah. you took your shahada in the nineties. Yes. How did how did September eleventh uh, affect like you and your family in particular, your non-Muslim family? How did how, what kind of impact did it have on you? Uh, there was only one incident um, after 9-11, um, and that was like in the aftermath of 9-11, where um, it was actually someone who lived on my road. And uh, myself and my family were coming home from visiting relatives. And I think this guy had been drinking. And, um, you know, as we were going past, he, he felt quite, you know, he had a bit of Dutch courage. And he just sort of, but all he said was like, just was like, watch out for tall buildings. Uh, that's all he said and um you know and i knew that he'd been drinking so i didn't really say anything to him actually i did but i don't want to repeat what i said i didn't swear but i um i did i, I responded in a, in a way where it was a bit sort of challenging um but i knew he wasn't gonna do or say anything because um he, it was just like just drinking it was under the influence um but after apart from that i mean obviously there was just that tension that um all muslims had uh in the aftermath like you know obviously um, you know, wondering what's going to happen, you know, how are people going to respond, uh, how they're going to, um, you know, uh, yeah, how they, are they going to uh, attack or whatever. But that was it, really, that one incident. Mm -hmm. But I know for others, it was far worse. 
Okay, alhamdulillah. How did it affect your your non-Muslim family members though? Did they have any? Did they have any comments, questions, issues? Yeah, I mean, you know, you, I think every weaver has maybe some uh, one one or more relative who are a little bit antagonistic towards um, Islam. So, uh, you know, you'd, you'd get something, but again, because of the the adab of you know, like prior to that. Um, you kind of end up getting backed up by the other family members, you know, because I always say that people get a feel of Islam through yourself and through the good Muslims. They always do, you know. So I, mm -hmm. I always say to someone, you know, when, when they say about Muslims are extremists and Muslims are terrorists or whatever, you know, ask them about, ask them about their neighbours. You know, they, they, they wouldn't have a bad thing to say about their neighbour, their Muslim neighbour. You know, so that's a testimony, mm -hmm. really. Alhamdulillah, alhamdulillah. Yeah. So, so brother Robert, you've got you've got a website called uh, Islam for Europeans. Is that right? Islam for Europeans dot com. Yep, that is correct. It's um, it's a Dawa website um, uh, that talks about issues um, related to uh, Muslims of European descent, um, our relationship uh, with the greater uh, Muslim community, um, and also um, you know I guess our our Qawm or our tribes people, our non-Muslim uh, of European non-Muslims of European descent, um, and you know uh, North America and Australia as well, um, because we're living in very um, kind of like different times uh, compared to even ten years ago, um, hmm. where you know we um, are kind of kind of facing a unique situation where um, you know the we're facing a lot of this Islamophobia. Uh, you know, from certain uh, white people in the white community, um, you know, whose anger has been magnified by uh, Trump, Brexit, um, you know, uh, different nationalist movements in, in European countries. Um, mm. And then on, on the other end, um, some of the more liberal Muslims are, are unifying with um, more like leftist uh, groups. Um, you know, where it's more identitarian politics uh, hmm. in order to gain... Which has its own issues as well, of course, yeah. yeah I mean, so, that has its own issues in and of itself, for sure. I mean, I, I can I can totally relate to you when you say about the whole, number one, identity politics, but also the issue around the far right, the the, the fascists, the extremists from, from the far right. Because I live up in the northeast of England, which is... It's very different to London. Jamal will, will, will tell you that he... He's from London. I'm from the north, and he's from the south. It's a different. It's a different ball game altogether. In the sense of, we, for me personally, I have a lot of uh, conversations with uh, the far right, especially with our dawa. When we when we do our dawa work up here, we have a, a greater presence, I guess, of the far right and the fascist movements. And for me, I have a slightly different approach, I guess, um, to many people who who deal with that. I like to I like to open up a conversation with individuals from those groups, rather than be um, sort of antagonistic, or rather than be defensive, or rather than you know get confrontational. We actually have a decent relationship um, with the far right up here in the north, in the sense that we can have open conversations. But AT, and we can have clarifications with that. At, yes. do you find that? You, it's easier for you to do that because of the fact that you're, you know, you, you head an organization that that deals with communicating with the wider community. I mean, what about the AT 20 years ago? Yeah. yeah so this is what I was saying that, you know, it, it, at the moment, as it stands with our Dower organization, we're able to have those conversations. We're able to have yeah. a sit down. I'll give you a quick example. You know, um, one of the, one of the, the leaders, if you like, of, um, the, the Northeast EDL, he attended some of our events. And the more he attended, and I was actually quite surprised, he brought his whole crew, about 15, 20 of them, they came and they started um, attending some of the, the, the programs. And the more they attended and the more they had conversations with us, the more they changed um, uh, their viewpoints. Him in particular, he was the, 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 the head at the time. And it wasn't just me, it was other Muslims as well in the community he was having conversations with. And basically, with you know, just like like the brother said, with the good manners, with having intelligence, with clarifications, and giving just some very decent dawah, if you like, 
he actually stepped down from the head of the EDL. He left the whole movement wow. and he changed his views completely. Whereas 20 years ago, in the 90s, 80s, 90s, grown up, um, it was a very, very different scenario. Uh, obviously, we, we were teenagers and stuff. And the, the, the other problem is they had, there was no dawah organizations. There was no dawah centers. There was maybe two mosques, one or two mosques. And they were your typical sort of um, Asian uncles and elders who didn't really mix, if that makes sense. That was 20, 25 years ago, right? 30 years ago. Um, things have changed a lot, though, since then. And now it's not a case of trying to um, uh, sort of clash with, with individuals like that. Because I, I empathize somewhat with some of their sentiment in terms of the ignorance and that they have and some of the things that they've been fed, the lies that they've been fed. So when you sit down with them and talk to them, most people will just have a normal conversation, especially when there's no drink involved and yeah. there's none of their group to be with them. <laughs> so the, the little yeah. crew, if you like. So I think um, for us, it's a slightly different situation up here that in some regards, I can completely empathize with, the, with where they're coming from because they just don't know any better until you have those conversations. And I guess that's what the, the purpose of Islam for Europeans website is for, Brother Robert, if, if I'm not mistaken, is to break down some of those barriers and say, you know, let's have a conversation about this. Let's discuss these issues, that some of the fears that you have, some of the, the issues that you're bringing to the table. Let me dispel some of them and let's, yeah. let, let, let's, have, a, let's have an open and frank discussion. Yeah, and it's, it's, it's definitely, uh, you know, uh, what we feel is our, our obligation, I guess, uh, you know, because, you know, we come from a European background, um, instead of trying to um, sort of reject our own community, which is what a lot of, uh, sort of converts do in general sometimes, unfortunately, especially uh, in North America uh, in the early like 90s and early 2000s, uh, you mm -hmm. know, they'll change the way they dress, change the way they act, change the way they talk. You know, like they're a white convert, they'll be like racist, racist, racist. I'm rejecting my family. I'm going, you know, like I'm disowning them. You know, I'm getting, you know, like, and that just, it just burn, they just burn all these bridges down. Mm. Uh, when really, if you're doing that, you're doing a disservice to the greater Muslim community. Of course, um, like for the Dawah so, especially. But right. th there's one thing that's interesting, because over here with the experiences that I've had in Britain and Europe, with, uh, with many of the, the, the reverts here, it's been the other way around. Whereas the, the, the person who accepted Islam didn't disown the family and the community, the family disowned them. Yeah. And, uh, you know, he rejected them and said, look, get out of my house. Many people become homeless as a result of it. And this is one of the, the things that we've had to put in place as a community, as a wider Muslim community, mm -hmm. having a good, strong new Muslim network and support in case of these when these incidents do happen. You know, so it's, it's, it's interesting because in North America, you say it's the other way around. But over here, it's slightly different in, in that they regard. They do get disowned. Yeah, there's different levels. Some of them do get disowned, unfortunately. Um, so the way we look at it is um, it, when it comes to uh, converts as a whole, if you look at like maybe if you look at it like a Venn diagram, we have a lot mm. in common. So there's a lot of commonalities between me and like a convert from South, black convert from South Philadelphia. And, you know, mm. the fact that, you know, like our, our families are not Muslim, our communities are not Muslim. You know, they're, you know, they're drinking, they're doing drugs, you know, they're, they're getting involved in violence, gambling, you know, so in that, in, in that sense, there's commonalities. Mm -hmm. um, but our approach is, um, in addition to um, uh, looking at it from a holistic perspective, uh, you know, uh, each group of converts, you know, based on their background, it's important for them to have a subcommunity as well. Because, uh, you know, there's some things that me as a white convert would understand, you know, growing up, say, for example, as an African-American uh, growing up in the, in the United States. Right. So I can provide some insight is, in terms of being a convert. But, you know, a lot of the times, uh, you know, you want that perspective from people who grew up with that with that background. So it's it, we, we didn't create this website to be exclusionary. We created it to, you know, uh, to add more to the community because. Our idea of a sub-community is, um, you know, a Muslim, a group of Muslims who have the same subculture, who come from the same background. Uh, they keep their own, they keep their culture, uh, you know, they keep uh, ties with their family, they keep ties with their greater cultural community. But at the same time, 
they're still, uh, you know, uh, connected to the greater Ummah. And um, I think that's important for people to have that because, especially in the United States, because, you know, if you look at the African-American community, you know, they had the largest conversion, mass conversion to Sunni Islam in the last 300 years. And what I can, you know, uh, in recent memory, um, you know, and when Malcolm left, you know, the, the NOI and, you know, converted to traditional Sunni Islam, you know, like, he still he opened the doors of dawah to you know all you know, all the community. He said that you know white people should study Islam, but at the same same time he still had his own organization dedicated to uh, you know uh, helping you know the uh, the status of African Americans. So for us, you know, we didn't create this website to be an, you know, a white nationalist offshoot. We looked at it as this is our responsibility. This is who we are. Uh, you know, we're still Muslim. You know, we mm. want to be connected to the greater Muslim community. But as Muslims from European background, it's our responsibility to kind of foster this idea that, A, you know, you can be white and you can convert to Islam, which is a lot of that's a misconception that's, that's, that can be common. Uh, mm. B, you know, like the greater, the more strength we are in numbers, the more, the greater voice we can have. Uh, you know, so sometimes it's not, giving da'wah sometimes it's not about converting people to Islam. Sometimes it's about getting maybe the white Islamophobe down the street from a negative 100 to a negative 99, you know, yeah. so maybe yeah. he'll change his mind and end up not going to that anti-mosque rally. Right. So mm. the more, the more we have the numbers for this, you know, like we can help grow the, our Muslim sub community from the ground up. Yeah. Um, and, and, and that way, you know, like uh, it solves a lot of problem, issues from across the board, you know, like even the left leaning Muslims who are more liberal, you know, like, uh, you know, like they may have issues with white converts even or white people in general because of, you know, privilege. But this solves that problem because, you know, like what could be more visibly Muslim than having our own organization, right? So, and, and we yeah, are that's using, true. That's, yeah. that's very true. And, and, I, and I do agree with, with most of that. I think the only, the only issue with that is, uh, and again, this is from experiences over here, um, because we have quite, up, up in the north, we have quite a large, Revit population um, uh, from the, the the English community and outside of the English community, if we, if ethnic minority community, I guess we could call it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now, the, the the interesting thing is, whenever we have people from within the white reverts who are doing dawa on the front line with us, we regularly get you know um, comments such as, "Oh, you're a traitor to the race, right? You're a traitor to our race," and um, a rejection from their own community with regards to when they're trying to give dawah to them. And then when somebody like me, who's not white English, gives dawah to the same people, we get a, a, a more of a positive reaction sometimes. Not all the time, mind, but sometimes we do. So I think in, in some cases, yes, and in some cases, no. It all depends on the situation, the community, the individual, and so on and so forth. So I think it, we have to take it a bit more with uh, a, on a case by case scenario. But because if you think about it from this point of view, you know, one of the things that I always say when it comes to um, whether it's the non Muslim community, the new Muslim community, the, the, the Muslims who are born in Muslim uh, families, etc., one of the things that I always do, even as part of my Dao when I'm calling non Muslims to understand what Islam actually stands for. One of the, and this is, I strongly believe this, one of the most beautiful things about Islam is the diversity that it represents. It transgresses, you know, borders, nationalities, cultures. And I think Malcolm X, you mentioned Malcolm X earlier. I think he best encapsulated it in, in his letter from Paris, where, where upon his return, he said, you know, America needs to understand Islam because this is the one religion that erases from it this the from from its society the race problem it erases from its society the race problem so yeah i think this is one of the things that is one of the most beautiful aspects of the religion of the deen of al-islam the religion of islam but at the same time having said that it respects and values people's traditions and cultures so long as it doesn't contradict the islamic principles and the sunnah of course right. and in some cases it's even intertwined you know um where both the, the culture and the religion can can overlap. In other cases, it can become Islam versus culture, right? So depending on the cultural practices and things like that. So I think it's one of those things, um, you know, one of the, the most beautiful key aspects of the religion is 
the concept of the ummah and the concept of the diversity. It's one of the reasons why the Prophet said, and, and, and I strong, strongly believe this, that Islam will enter into every home it, because of this diversity and this, you know, going beyond these man made structures, uh, political and social constructs. Um, Islam tr transcends all of that. And I think that's one of the most beautiful things about it. Okay, well, yeah, I mean, I, I don't disagree with you. I think, I, I you, know, uh, you know, diversity is, is one of the wonderful things about Islam. Um, I think for, uh, for some converts, though, in, in, who are in kind of these situations where, um, you know, they're, they have a lot of heat coming from their family members. Um, see, we have to look at it this way as well. In the, in the Muslim world, uh, you know, we have all these different, you know, we, we have Islam in all these different countries and the, you know, Islam is represented by that country. So, for example, in China, Islam looks Chinese. I mean, the mosques look like pagodas. Um, in, in Malaysia, Islam looks Malay. I mean, the, the masjids, you know, look very similar to, to Malaysian uh, architecture. Um, yeah. Africa, Islam looks African, right? So um, the, the culture... Uh, you, know, you know, like Islam is not culturally Influence. predatory, um, and I think yeah, it influences it influences the practices. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So in terms um, of like the, the architecture and the clothing, yeah, no doubt. I think uh, that's why I said that you know it can't even be intertwined because you have from from a Sunnah perspective, you have the framework of Islam, where there is room for maneuver and movement, mm -hmm. for uh, adopt uh, basically adapting to or uh, for allowing certain cultural practices to be acceptable, right? So things like the way you cook your chicken, Robert, will be different to the way I cook my chicken. But as long as it's halal, then it's all good, right? Of so course. that's where the diversity, the beauty of the diversity is 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 expanded upon. Well, yeah, I think I think we're pretty much in agreement. Um, I think, uh, you know, looking at a little, a little bit more in depth, um, you know, if we look at several Muslim cultures, they tend to be very... Uh, 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 endogamous. So, you know, a lot of them marry within the same, don't even want to marry outside the same city or without, you know, outside the same country. Now, I used to think that that was, you know, full out racist, but many times, you know, it's out of necessity. I mean, you know, like um, mm. just be, again, Islam respects diversity and everything, but I think for a lot of converts, um, many times they rush into into things like marriage uh, and they're in a totally different situation than people growing up in a Muslim family. So, for example, mm. we don't date in Islam. So, you know, the the fact that you don't know this person through dating, uh, the Mus Muslim family, they have usually a network of people they know, they can investigate the family, you know, they can find out, you know, what's wrong with this person, what's, you know, like, you know, if, would this be a suitable match for my son or a daughter? Whereas for the convert, they're in a totally different situation because, they don't know anybody. So a lot of times they go into a Muslim community as complete outsiders. So they're not dating, but at the same time, they really have no way of in investigating uh, what a potential match uh, might be like. Um, and a lot, and again, again, they have to learn the dean. They have to learn how to pray. They have to learn all these things. It's a huge, incredible learning curve. Um, and sometimes it can work out. You know, like I'm not saying that it's that, that you know, like the only the convert should only marry with it, other converts. All the time but i'm just saying that um you know in in many contexts a lot of the times you know they think you know this is going to solve all of our problems getting married quickly right away to a different culture mm. uh but many times that's not the case and a lot of times it ends in divorce it can end in very ugly divorce sometimes and this mm. is a reality so even even within muslim cultures within the same country city to city you know I've seen it. They've seen it before where they wanted to get married to each other. You know, say, for example, one a Palestinian from Gaza and a Palestinian from Nablus. Um, and it ended up being a disaster because disaster. The, yeah, yeah. the culture is totally different. So hmm. I understand where people are it, coming from. Is that to do with culture, though, or is that to do with compatibility? Like, for example, what I mean by that is, you know, marriage is, is a beat. And I'm going to let Jamal talk about this because he's been involved in this for such a long time. He's got a lot of experience in in um, dealing with marriages and, and helping brothers and sisters get married, especially from the, the reverts. Um, but, you know, for marriage in general is, uh, 
it's, it's not an easy thing anyway. It's not something which, even if it, no. if you marry somebody from within your own community and culture, it's still a difficult thing. It's There's yeah. no guarantee that it's going to be successful, right? So right. there's huge divorce rate in South Asians, for example, at the moment, even though they're married from the same tribe and, and whatever else. So I think, I don't know, is that something to do with the, 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 the modern day world that we live in today? Or is it something to do with just general compatibility issues, or is it to do with the cultures, cultural differences, or is it a combination of all of them? You know, so it can be, it's a bit more complex, I think, yeah. than simplifying it just as somebody from a different culture, and that's one of the reasons why. Even okay. though I'm not opposed to people marrying from, you know, converts yeah. marrying other converts, I'm not opposed to that either. I think it's, um, I think it's a bit more of a complex situation than that, though, personally. Yeah, I, find it, I find it very interesting, actually, because, um, first of all, I, I mean, I, uh, I, I can't imagine, um, you know, um, a, a white revert um, experiencing difficulties in getting married um, outside of, um, you know, or into any other culture. Um, I, I, in the UK, um, you know, um, I used to refer to um, like white reverts. So when I used to have my marriage service, I was like hot property because, mm. uh, <laughs> you know, because it was just very easy. And then, uh, Robert, you mentioned about like the, sort of like cultural kind of um, differences. Um, but even then, I've always found that um, other cultures would sort of um, would would sort of you know they'd sort of buckle to to try to adapt to um, you know the, the reverse culture, depending on on what maybe the expectations might be of that revert. For example, maybe some things they might be used to, um, you know, and stuff like that. But yeah, I find it quite interesting when you said that because I you know that, that's that's quite new to me. I'm sure in in Canada it might be the same as everywhere else in the world when it comes to white reverts. I mean. Usually, it's like not too much of a problem, but you said that you experienced that a lot um, in Canada. Yeah, I mean, I've seen a lot of converts just uh, get into marriage right away. This didn't happen to me personally. Alhamdulillah, like uh, you know, I'm happy, happily married now. But I've we've seen many uh, converts get into marriage, and sometimes it's you know both parties have the best interests in mind. Yeah, and uh, you know, it, yeah. it's still a very high divorce rate, and. Uh, I understand it's a very complex situation, but you know a lot of times it can ruin uh, the the uh, the converts uh, iman. So I think they really need to sit down and say like, what are your expectations? What are the expectations of each family? Um, you know, because a lot of the times on both sides they don't really realize what they're getting into. Um, so mm -hmm. I, 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 you know, I'm just all I'm saying is that um, it's not a panacea. A lot of people think that you know, like, oh, let's just you know, like marry people willy nilly, like it's square dancing. I mean, you know, like a lot of the times it doesn't, it doesn't work that way. And it's a very complicated situation, especially when they first, first convert to Islam, because they don't I know what their rights that. are, they don't know what their responsibilities are, and they're yeah, coming yeah. in as complete outsiders. So, um, uh, like, you know, I agree, it's, it's a very complicated situation. Um, for, for, normally for white converts, yeah, we get a lot of marriage proposals but again those you know like it's not may not necessarily be a, a good thing all the time <laughs> because a lot of the times you have the people who are just starting out and yeah. you know yeah. like again like i said with a non-muslim family you have no protective factors so mm. you know like not definitely if if you don't have a muslim family to protect you if the husband gets out of line you don't have an you know your uncle muslim mm. uncle is going to come you know is beat it, you up or get, you know like yeah. uh and that 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 can create a lot of issues as well too. Definitely, so definitely. Yeah. So I guess one of the things that I would say to that is, um, you know, one of the things that we teach with our new Muslim support programs uh, over here, up in the north, certainly, is, and I'm sure Jamal says the same thing. And like I mentioned, Jamal's been involved with, you know, trying to organize marriages and uh, and help people who need to get married in the past for many many years, uh, as have I. Uh, especially with the revert situation, it is. Yeah, there, there certainly are some challenges. That is that is true. But one of the things that I always tell the the new Muslim, the, the revert, don't worry about marriage for now. Focus on learning your deen. Understand the 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 basic principles of your religion. Understand your rights and and what needs to be done. And then we can think about that later on. You know, when you're ready for that, then we'll we'll help you with that as well. And we'll support you with that as well as and when it comes. So, def hundred percent, I agree with that. You know the. Every single Muslim, not just reverts, but every single Muslim should know their religion to a certain degree and a certain standard um, before they even contemplate marriage. 
You know, that's my general advice I give to everybody anyway, Absolutely. regardless whether they are reverts or, or, or born into Muslim families. Absolutely. Well, I, I agree with it 100%. Um, obviously, there is that same challenge of um, when a new revert, you know, comes into the dean and the first thing they're told is, oh, no, you just need to get married. And it, it is literally <laughs> one of the first things they're told, you know, and, um, but, you know, obviously that can be problematic as well. But, I mean, just going back to um, the, you know, the, the website that you have, Islam for Europeans, um, I wanted to find out from you, like, how, when, when, did, when did you um, set this up? Um, and what were the, um, I know you mentioned some of the reasons for, for, you know, setting it up. Um, but do you really have, even within, you know, in Canada, for example, as a white weaver, I know AT, you also mentioned that, um, the brothers in Newcastle, uh, they get sort of, uh, you know, a bit of slack from the, 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 the white non-Muslim community. But, um, at the same time, I mean. Not, not the whole white non-Muslim community, just the certain very yeah, small yeah. segment yeah. who are linked to the far right and, and the fascists yeah. because I the mean, majority are absolutely spot on up here they yeah. are very very friendly and very open yeah because that's what i was thinking i mean even in Robert in canada maybe you know you should have you must have some really good uh you know like stories of where you know you've helped the um you know your community for example and people kind of are a bit pleasantly surprised that oh, you're muslim and you know and, it, and that becoming like a good source of dawah yeah, man, in Canada, everyone gets along, don't they? Yeah, no, we're pretty friendly up here for the most part. Um, it, it's Canada's interesting because we're very widely spread out, you know, like, uh, and it's, Islam is kind of in its infancy, like you were talking about what Britain was 20 years ago. That's kind of like where we're at now. Because right, right, right. Aside from Toronto, uh, you know, like uh, you, the cities are very far apart. You might have just one, 10, maybe 50 Muslims in like these smaller towns and cities, uh, max. So it's really in its infancy stage and there's not a lot of converts and it's kind of a chicken or the egg problem too, because, you know, the more converts there are in a, in a large city, the more like people are, you know, Oh, this might be something for me. Like these, these people, like they grew up with the same normalized, background, they become Muslim yeah. too. So I don't think it's become quite normalized as yet. And I think, I think it's kind of a, kind of a different uh, situation, but, uh, in terms of the uh, in terms of the website, it, it started um, about a year ago um, by a Russian brother. His name is uh, Harun, um, and he, you know, like uh, his perspective is more the because because they're born Muslim there, you know, the uh, white Russian uh, Muslims, and their experience, mm -hmm. you know, in Eastern Europe, you know, where it's you know, the situations are even way way more difficult. Um, so we're kind of in different situations, but at the same time, um, we have to. Part of the reason why we created it is not just because, you know, to say, oh, we're oppressed, we're oppressed. No, that's not what it's about. You know, a lot of the times, um, you know, a lot of these Muslim communities don't really know what to do uh, with, you know, the white convert, especially in, in Canada. So their idea is to like assimilate them into the into the Muslim community, uh, which is understandable because we're like the only one, uh, you know, maybe the only one in the mosque. So, you know, they're just doing what they know. Um, but for us, it's more about creating an integrated identity where, you know, like we're still connected to our white community. We're fully Muslim, you know, like we follow all the tenets of Islam. We don't believe in racism, uh, you know, like, uh, and uh, for us, like this is our special uh, responsibility because, you know, Allah, you know, guide us for, you know, like a certain reason, like we have, you know, we have to do something on our end. And as more as a collective group, we feel that, you know, even with a small website like this, um, you know, we can normalize the idea of, you know, white people saying, you know, converting to Islam and staying in the deen. Uh, so, yeah, that's that that's probably like the main reasons why we created this website. That's brilliant. I think that's I think that's very I think it's a noble effort for sure, because um, the, I, I see where you're coming from and I see the, the, the purpose behind it. One thing that I would like to ask, though, is, you know, with regards to. Um, the, when you said that the, the, when they go to the mosques and they assimilate them into the mosques and things like that because there's so few numbers uh, mm -hmm. essentially one of the things that's interesting is we and I don't know if it's the same in Canada I mean I was only in I was in Toronto in um, uh, just November gone and it was inter an interesting place and I've been to other parts of Canada on, I think it was Ontario um, or was it Quebec I can't remember yeah it was it was about 10 years ago but or more than 10 years ago but the point is um over here, for sure, we have, and I'm assuming it's the same over there, lots of different mosques with different backgrounds. 
So you might have over here, you might have something like the, the Pakistani mosque or the Bangladeshi mosque and, you know, things like that, which is really the, the problem that I have with those type of mosques is they're very culturally orientated rather than Islamically orientated, if that makes sense. If, if I can use that term, I don't know if it's, if it's the right way way of articulating it but you know sometimes you get certain muslim communities or certain mosques which are very they're more cultural than they are religious if if, if that makes sense and the, the the mosques that that i normally you know try to to link myself with and work with are the mosques that are, that are mo the most diverse so for example the, the mosques that are very close to the sunnah and practicing the sunnah like our mosque here in newcastle newcastle central mosque we have over 33 different nationalities praying in that masjid from the, the management committee all the way down to the congregation. It's it's extremely diverse. And they're the type of masajid which really represent, for me, represent the, the true beauty and, and essence of Islam in, in that diversity that comes with it. And nobody really feels like an out, outsider in that regard. So yeah. I'm just wondering, is it because of the cultural type of mosques that the, 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 the reverts have been assimilated to, or is it something a bit more than that? Well, I actually, I actually disagree. I, I, um, you know, I think the umbrella masjid definitely has its place, and it's very important to have that, that umbrella masjid in large cities. But I, I, I love the quote unquote ethnic or cultural masjids because you, you, when you go in there, they don't disallow anybody from going in there. But you know, mm -hmm. you become part of, you know, you enter into that culture. So that culture is represented by uh, that brick and mortar uh, masjid. Um, so, for example, in Windsor, where I grew up, we have the Turkish club. Uh, we have a mosque that's, uh, you know, run by the Tabliki Jama'a that's mostly South Asian. And we have the Umbrella Mosque. Uh, in Chatham, which is a small city of about 40,000 people, there's a Darul Uloom. And not, I would say 100% of them are South Asian. And it's <laughs> in, this, in the middle of this, subhanAllah, this white community, like the suburban white community. So it's it really out of nowhere. And I had a good talk with the um, imam of that masjid. And uh, he agreed with me, like, look, he like he agrees that like, look, like when people convert to Islam in this city, like, you know, we wouldn't know what to do with them because, uh, you know, like we had come from a totally different cultural background. Mm. And I told him, look, like, what if we had like sort of like an auxiliary, uh, you know, uh, group, you know, for converts? We have our own little office space, you know, brick and mortar place specifically for us, you know, and Salatai comes, everyone comes and prays. But at the same time, there's a place, a, you know, a room at least dedicated for people who those who are interested in Islam, you know, where they can talk to someone, uh, you know, like uh, who's from that particular background. And that doesn't mean that only we should be giving dawah to our own people. I mean, I mean, anyone can give dawah. It doesn't matter where they're from. But mm -hmm. no, I disagree. I actually think the quote unquote cultural masjid or even like, you know, like, uh, you know, like in Canada, we have uh, groups based on uh, national Muslim groups based on nationality. Like, for example, the Syrian uh, Muslim community. I went to their Eid prayer a couple of years ago. And you need, a, you need a community like that for Syrians who are refugees who need to get acclimated here. So I, I you know, I, I, I think the Umbrella Master definitely has its place. But we, we totally support, you know, like the, you know, um, different Muslim groups having their own organization. Uh, because that you know, like embodies the culture of the people. Like even yeah. in the uh, Habashis, when they came and went to the Eid prayer in the Prophet's mosque that, you know, everyone knows as Hadith, they did their traditional sword ceremony and Umar radiallahu and wanted to stop it. And the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, said, no, 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 let them finish. And he let, because that was important to them for their culture. So I think um, I, I agree. And that's why we supported the Black American Muslim Conference mm. because they have, you know, issues that are specific to them. That they need, you know, that uh, that are important to them, and uh, you know, we sent out a letter, you know, officially endorsing uh, the conference uh, because, again, like uh, it's important to them. It's it's their history, it's their heritage, it's their culture, and uh, you know, we don't want to try to um, how do I put this uh, deny it. You know, again, like I said, the umbrella masjid has its place, but I think cultural masjids and organizations also have their place as, as well, and I think they're just as important. Yeah, I, do, I don't know. I'm I'm not sure. I think that uh, I think well, that from yeah, yeah. No, I, I mean, there's there's no there's no harm in disagreeing on on points. But I think I think the the problem that I have is from from what I've seen over the so many decades. I think the cultural mosques and having those divisions actually causes more harm than good 
uh, maybe good for those particular communities, but not good for the wider community and society. And I think the, the example that you gave of the Habishis who were doing their sort of ceremonial, traditional, cultural um, uh, practice at that time, absolutely, you will find that it's completely permissible to do that as long as it doesn't contradict the Sunnah. But that doesn't, it, it's not an evidence to suggest that they have their own bricks and mortar, their own place, because that's not what they did. They didn't have their own space, if you like, or building to do that. They did it inclusively with the rest of the community. That's what well, we need. I think that's that. I think that's exactly what we we need. We need to try to find a way of of um, that happening, rather than um, maybe uh, creating maybe like some a separate entity. Because I think that's what the impression people might get is if you have your own separate thing, for example. I mean, is that is that what we're saying that you'd have something separate in that way? No, no, not at all. Uh, okay. Like I said, cultural masjids, uh, you know. Uh, you know they have to follow the sunnah as well. I mean, like I've never seen of any cultural masjid that don't that disallow worshippers from coming to their masjid. Um, and again, like we're you know we're taking a, a seventh century example and extrapolating it to the twenty first century. Like if you go to a masjid in China, you know, all the Muslims are going to be most of them are going to be China, from Chinese, and it's going to look like a Chinese mosque. You know, with you know mm. like Islam spreading outward, I can understand why people would want to criticize the cultural masjid especially when it's in the West, people get the idea that, you know, you have to be of this culture to be to be Muslim. I think their uh, obligation is they have to realize that, um, again, like the majority of the, of the worshipers come from a specific culture. So, you know, we should support endeavors to reach out to other communities and let them know that, hey, you guys, you know, like anyone can become a Muslim. You should be able to ha hold on to your culture. And I think over time, like hopefully they will become more accepting of other cultures as well. But at the same time, uh, you know, like, again, you know, like I like go being able to go to any masjid I want in a big city, say, hey, you know, I want to get some chicken. I want to get some biryani for iftar, <laughs> you know, or I can go to the Arab mosque. Say, hey, maybe I'm looking want to get Arabic food. But for mm -hmm. us, like, I mean, the goal, maybe even a small brick and mortar office organization with the musalla that is inclusive to everybody where everybody is invited but the 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 main core goal is that you know we want to improve the relationship between the muslim world and the west I mean, the muslim Robert, world our own Robert, white community yeah. and you know the muslim community at large because it's very 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 necessary I you not see that there's a lot of islamophobia yeah do you not you know, see a danger but, um robert in that where um Maybe you might have some attendees that might take it completely the wrong way and take it completely like, you know, this is for us, this is for whites, and then maybe a little bit of white supremacism might sort of come into it as well. I mean, do you not see that there's a potential, you know, even a small potential of that happening? And how would you mitigate that? How would you, you know, deal with something like that? Well, I run, even on the website, I run a very tight ship. And uh, I, you know, even when I gave it, when I did, uh, had a debate discussion with Umar Lee on, on Blood Brothers, I said, look, if you see any anyone posting, any white Muslim posting like this, you know, things that are against Islam, like that may, maybe even even construed as, you know, white supremacist stuff, uh, we completely condemn it. Uh, we do not allow that at all. Uh, and even in giving dawah to, uh, you know, like those type of people, you know, we have to very strictly follow the sunnah as well. Mm. So they're not our brothers. Obviously, my brothers are the Muslims, right? They're our tribe, yeah, but they're not our brothers. So, you know, we come we can come to agreement on certain issues like conservative family values and things like that. But when it comes to things like, you know, well, this group is better than that group, no, we have to draw a line in the sand and say, no, we don't accept things like that. Mm -hmm. So, you know, like, um, you know, because even though, I don't know that Richard Spencer is actually studying Islam now. He's seen as his YouTube video. I think I gave it to Abu Tayyib as well. I don't know if I've showed you that video, but I send it to me. Send it Islam, to me. But they didn't. They couldn't find. I don't know if they didn't try, but they couldn't find any Muslims from Ahl Sunnah to even talk to. Like, or no one reached out to say, "Hey, maybe we should, you know, give some dawah about Islam." And it, and they ended up talking to Louis Farrakhan from the Nation of Islam, and they invited right. him in, and they, they got, that's how they got their information about Islam. And I just thought, oh, man. right. Like, you know, you have to weigh the bad and the good. I think uh, yeah. that's definitely a point that we are cognizant of. And, you know, we don't don't accept anyone 
know, spouting that type of uh, that type of stuff, and we're very, very strict about that. So, like I said, I run a tight ship, and you know, like uh, <laughs> the last thing we want to do is make our Muslim brothers and sisters feel uncomfortable. You know, like mm. you know, uh, you know, like that's that's the opposite of what we want to achieve. We want to uh, do our part to try to um, you know lower Islamophobia among our own people. So. There's a, there's a, there's an interesting comment by Muslim BB about this very particular issue. Don't he's asking the question. Don't cultural mosques bring about a split in the Ummah? Um, the Turkish mosques is for the Turks, the Pakistani ones for the Pakistanis, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And that's uh, essentially that's my point, I guess. But you know, the the, the, the in, in, to answer that and in response to um, Brother Robert's point, um, there's some very poignant points there. I think which I agree with, and in, in some things, and then obviously some things we need to explore a bit more. But you know, having having your own space, I, I don't have a, a an overall problem with that. I guess it's as long as it is inclusive for everybody. And the problem that I've got is sometimes our mosques. When I say our Asian mosques, I'm talking about they're not very inclusive. And mm. and I've seen that. I've had many arguments and challenged it. And hence why the masjid that we set up is very inclusive. And and it doesn't have to be. My point is, it doesn't have to be like that. So with our Dawah Center, for example. Um, we have a whole new Muslim support program. Now, does it have to have a separate space in that for certain communities and groups um, in order for it to be able to support reverts? No, I don't think so. In some regards, yes, maybe having the right people in place, but does it have to be a separate space altogether? Well, our Dawah Center has proven otherwise. The Dawah Center that we run, IDC, actually shows that you can have that diversity it's in the name actually islamic diversity center right um has that divert can have that diversity um whilst sharing the cultural practices and accepting of all the cultures and cultural backgrounds and being nuanced enough to be able to deal with the challenges that the the reverts have and we've been doing this what for since 2002 what's uh, 18 years right so we've been doing this for almost 18 years and we found uh, quite a good balance, actually, where you can get um, white reverts, black reverts, Asian reverts, um, South Asian reverts, and also uh, those who are born into Muslim families to be able to share the same space and come to an understanding between one another without compromising each other's cultures, if that makes sense. I just need to charge my I get my charger for my iPad before I black out on you guys. Go for it. Ten percent. I'll be back. We'll go through some of the comments while while you while you get your charger. Yeah. Yeah, I'll be right back. Hold on a second. All, All right, no problem. We've got brother Go. We've got brother Goran. Uh, let's start with brother Goran. He says, oh, "Allah grant shifa to those suffering from coronavirus." Dua by Sheikh Sudais. Amin. Uh, amin. Amin. Absolutely. May Allah protect everybody, the Muslims and ev the wider community, everybody else, all humans from uh, this fitna that we're facing today of the coronavirus. Um, let's see, what other comments do we have? We'll come to that one, the question in a moment when Brother Robert's back. Assalamu alaikum from Brother Tariq. Wa alaikum assalam. Um, uh, wa alaikum salam. Is the Nation of Islam still big in America? From what I know, I don't think they're as big as they used to be. Um, here's, here's a question for you, Jamal, from Muslim BB. I always get confused about this. Do you prefer convert or revert or does it make a does it not make a difference? What's your reply to that, Jamal? So, my preference is um, revert uh, to rather than to convert because um, you know, as as we know, um, you know, we're all born in the fitra. So, you know, we, as we know, uh, before we're even born, we're Muslims, uh, and then when we're born, we become whatever our parents, or whatever faith they are. Um, so, when we come to the Dean of Islam, you know, um, it just makes sense when someone says revert. It makes sense. Whereas a convert, you know, obviously that's the um, the, the the more common uh, term, um, but convert makes it come across as if it was something which is alien uh, to begin with. Um, whereas you know, the submission and the Islam was never alien in the beginning. So revert definitely one hundred percent. I've I've never used the term convert. Never revert. Just is just sweet, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> what about you, brother Robert? What's what's your preference, revert or convert? Muslim BB is asking the question. He always gets confused about this. Do you prefer convert or revert, or does it make a difference? It doesn't make a difference to me. I think there's so <laughs> many issues that converts have, uh, especially 
especially here that it's just so far down on my list that it doesn't <laughs> if i had to choose i'd go convert just because um even though i can understand why the term revert uh, yeah. applies again um even though yes people were born on the fitra but you're mm. relearning you have to learn a totally you know like uh you have to learn how to pray you have to learn how to fast you have to learn quran you have to learn all these things so yeah. um you're still it's still a process uh but yeah. it, it doesn't really matter to me yeah. <laughs> i just here's an issue all together we have more important things yeah. to talk about <laughs> yeah no i remember a very there's a very famous uh sister mashallah who um uh we knew her before she became muslim and she used to hate the term revert goes, what's this really she used to hate it because obviously because she didn't have that understanding anyway so um you know but now mashallah she, she's coming to the dean and, I'm, and she fully understands that but yeah i mean it's it, it, you know if it makes someone feel uh you know a bit offish when you use that term then you don't have to use it you could use you can interchange it as you wish anyway mm. yeah i don't i just don't want to get into an argument about it <laughs> i mean yeah, <laughs> yeah I just okay so want... Yeah. But Muslim BB is also asking, what are the biggest challenges that reverts have? Um, so in your in your experience, Brother Robert, what would you say, let's say the top three, the top three biggest challenges that reverts face in, in Canada, what would you say that they were? Um, yeah, feeling, uh, well, loneliness is a, is a huge factor. Um, mm. That's the first thing that came to my mind. I mean, um, especially we're such a, such a dispersed country of Muslims, like a lot of the times you're having iftar on your own, you're having suhoor on your own, you're going to Eid prayer, you know, like as the only Muslim f member of your family, uh, whereas you see all these smiling families on Eid, um, you know, like, alhamdulillah, like a lot of brothers are really helping me out with that. So uh, that helps out a lot. Uh, but loneliness mm -hmm. is definitely uh, one of them. Um, for me, I think when I first converted, um, uh, fasting was definitely a challenge. Um, I was used to eating like every half hour. So that, you know, like and that was back when Ramadan was in November. <laughs> I mean, mm -hmm. alhamdulillah, like I didn't convert when, you know, Ramadan was in June. I had time to like prepare and everything. Um, so for me personally, fasting was difficult. Um, and, uh, yeah, like feeling that, um, I don't know, like it's a, it's such a, it's a, it's a, when I first converted, I said had such a zeal, I think after the years go on um you know like i think if negative experiences happen to you i think bitterness is is a factor as well and you have to just mm. you can't get bitter because you know like you get you be very you know that allah was going to test you and you have to be very grateful that he got you to islam but um you know like um you're gonna many converts and it's inevitable even people who are born muslim are gonna encounter many battle scars and mm. you know like Muslims who like physically assaulted them and uh you know like yeah. uh, negative situations like that and you just can't let that affect your deen but at the same time it, it's inevitable like you know it's you, you know you, you just uh, after a while you just sort of develop this Pavlovian reaction to you know anyone saying anything negative so I mean uh that's over the years it can really it can kind of wear you out but you just have mm. to keep saying alhamdulillah for everything Absolutely, yeah. Alhamdulillah, that's, that's that's absolutely correct. Jamal, what about you, bro? What's your, would you say, the top three challenges as a revert? What would you say they are? Wow, very, very good question. I mean, based on some of the things and, and the concerns that um, Robert highlighted earlier, um, one of the biggest challenges, um, if you um, are alone in terms of, for example, a black river in the, the locality or a white river in a locality and you go to the masjid and you have no understanding of the deen whatsoever, um, you, you do feel very, very alien and you feel also very isolated. And although you might have warm, uh, you know, like greetings and you might feel very welcome, uh, but it's like what happens after that, you know, the, the, as you mentioned, culture, um, things like that. And even the culture, of, even the, the, the natural culture of the Dean itself, like it's still, even that is very alien to you. Um, and when you assimilate into that, you feel it, it, it's a challenge. It's, it's very much of a challenge because you, you go home and you sort of maybe start to you know question whether, um, you know, you're doing the right thing or not. But um, when you have, other reverts around you that's completely different you know when i became muslim i had um my brother-in-laws around with me and that was completely different you know obviously going in to take my shahada and coming out but uh, you know we experience and um, we, we, we see many many reverts who are on their own 
uh, and they, for example, Robert, you took it, um, you were online and you found out about Islam and then you took it. So you took your shahada. So after that point, you know, where do you go from there? So that's a big, massive challenge. And I think many people um, have left the Dean um, because of it. Um, that's probably one of the greatest challenges. And I guess, yeah, I mean, the others are just the fact that, you know, when, when you do um, experience hostilities in terms of from, uh, you know, from another um, race of Muslims, uh, that is also quite a big challenge. You, you don't, obviously, the way you feel, the way you're made to feel. Uh, but for myself, I've never really experienced that again because, you know, obviously, um, it's more about just going to someone and engaging with them straight away. Uh, and when and then you'll find out if someone's a bit offish or whatever, then you know you can just disregard them. And very quickly, um, if you have that kind of uh, personality, um, you'll start to find decent people straight away. And then you can you know you can sort of grasp onto them and they sort of take along the journey. Um, but definitely the biggest challenge is um, just getting there and assimilating. And you know, if you for want of a better word, that is very difficult. You know so. Yeah, I mean, I know many, many challenges, but that's just one of the first things when you become when you come into the dean. Just understand mm. that, and understand. I think it's interesting that you say that because one of the things that we normally advise when it comes to, um, especially for for brand new Muslims, you know, those who have recently taken their shahada, what we normally try to do is um, straight away get them get get them a mentor, right? A good, solid, practicing yeah. brother upon the sunnah or sister upon the sunnah, who yeah. will be able to. Um, teach them not only the salah, but also the, the basics of aqidah, the basics of their deen, so that we don't, we don't, and we, we don't usually just tell them just go straight to the masjid. We normally try and get them transitioned, I guess, to, to get into the community where it's, where it's not going to cause them confusion, where it's not going to cause them um, these, you know, the, some of these bad experiences that some people yeah. have when they're left, when they're left on their own. Yeah. So in case of, Making sure that it's uh, the, the appropriate people are with them, not just left to their own devices. And I can give you a quick example of a disaster that happened with one of our reverts, um, uh, the ones that we were supporting. He, he basically um, uh, he, he went to one of the one of the cultural mosques, if I if I can call it that. And I, by the way, when I say cultural mosque, I don't mean it with any disrespect, right? And I don't mean it in in a negative way like that. It's just there are some things which. In my view, you can cause more harm than good, and then gives those negative experiences, which could could have been avoided. That's mm. the that's the reason why I, I, I'm I'm using in quotation marks and explaining it this way. Is um, he went uh, by himself, very new in, in the religion. He went by himself to to go and pray. I think it was Isha Salah in in one of the the masjids, um, and the the old uncles that were there. Again, this was like twenty whatever years ago. Uh, he he went there to pray sunnah before the salah started, and then it was like uh, he had. By the time he finished his salah, he had like a ring of 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 brothers surrounding him, just observing him praying what? in their own language, saying, "What is he doing? Is he supposed to be here? Was, did he come to the wrong place or whatever?" You know, it was like, like wow. guys, come on, man, relax. This this is he, he's he's a Muslim. He's come here. He had such a negative experience. He goes, "I'm wow. never going to masjid again." Wow. Right? And I said to him, bro. The, the, this is why we, we we work with certain masajid because they're a bit more open-minded, if you like, and they're a bit more accepting um, of other cultures. Whereas if they've just got their own culture, it's a bit more difficult for it was a bit more difficult for them to accept somebody from outside of their culture who would pray there, and they would weren't just get used to it, right? Um, so I think that's to avoid those negative experiences. I think there's um, uh, the same way with the marriage thing that Brother Robert mentioned earlier on. You know, there was one brother, he said uh, he became Muslim, and every time somebody came to congratulate him or give him salams, Brother, you married yet? Are you married yeah. yet? Are you going to get married yet? And he was oh. so sick of hearing it. Yeah. Honestly, he pushed him nearly to the edge of leaving Islam because oh. he was so, he said, I don't want to get married. I'm not ready to get married. I, I'm not interested in getting married. And, and I said, Look, and I agreed with him. I said, You need to learn your religion first. So that when you are ready to get married, you know where you stand with all of this. So there are a number of negative aspects that come with this, which I totally understand the, the website Islam for Europeans, because it can deal with some of those challenges um, from a completely different perspective. I, I, I totally understand that. Yeah, yeah, if I could add something, uh, you know, it just popped in my head. Uh, one of the challenges, um, um, and I didn't really think about this until 
years after it became Muslim. I think uh, if I can encapsulate it, it would be being put on a pedestal sometimes because a lot of the times the especially the white convert, you know, the mosque will take them in and they'll be like mm. this white savior and like, mm. oh, this person's gonna, you know, like, uh, you know, uh, you know, be a like uh, sort of like you know, like reform our whole society and like you know, you know, like uh, you know, like take our mosque to like the next level and. And a lot of the times they're just totally not prepared for this. They don't understand the, mm-hmm. the culture, you know, they understand the religion and they're put in these positions and given all this aid and, uh, you know, like, and, uh, and, and positions that I can understand to an extent where the mosque is coming from because, you know, they want to, they're trying to like keep them in the Dean. But um, a lot of the times, you know, for example, like they'll put such a high emphasis on it. Like we had one brother who converted recently, this happened years ago. And they gave him a free Umrah trip and he had not been Muslim for more than a couple of weeks. So they spent all this money on him. He went to Umrah. He didn't understand what he was doing. Uh, you know, like, uh, you know, like, why are we walking around the cop? Why are we walking around this black stone? Why are we walking back and forth from here? You know, uh, um, you know, like, why is this culture the way, you know, it is, you know, why do I, have, why am I running across the street in like a crowded, you know, like freeway to get to this restaurant and, you know, like when he got back, he was depressed because the mosque mm. just spent all this money out on him. And, you know, like the guy who still was beforehand was drinking alcohol. So once he started drinking again, like it was almost like he was back on the wagon and, you know, he just felt so much shame. He just didn't want to go back. Mm. So I think if you look at the early Sahaba, you know, like there were, they didn't have to follow any ahkam for like the first 13 years. It was just la ilaha illallah. I'm not saying that we should be given 13 years to learn the deen, but mm. I think our expectations sometimes of converts are just very high because when we think of a convert, we think someone whose Iman is at like such a high level. Like when they meet a convert, like, Oh my God, you're so much stronger than I am. And you don't know, this convert might be going through, you know, like committing sins left and right. So I think uh, being put on a pedestal is something we need to. And that's one of the things we stress on our website is that we want to be taken away from this white savior status. That is yeah. just <laughs> making. No, I, I agree with that. I agree with that hundred percent. I think because it's 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 throwing people in the deep end. Essentially, that's what it is. And and I completely understand um, what you're saying there. And and I and I definitely don't disagree with that. I think putting putting people on a pedestal generally is is, is problematic. But certainly, when you're a new Muslim, the, the expectations are too high. Sometimes we set the bar a bit too high, and it's and and that can be really really detrimental. I have no doubt. I mean, I remember a, a brother who. He's actually from Brazil. He he went to um, I can't remember the full story. I just remember hearing uh, one of the brothers telling me about him, and uh, essentially what happened was he he committed suicide. Uh, you know, he, he went that far uh, that it that it was affecting him. So he was so depressed. I'm not. I don't know what the actual causes were. Whether it was because of the masjid or this, I don't know what the reasons were. He may have had mental health um, uh, issues be, prior to accepting Islam. I don't know, but the point was he was. Um, so depressed that he eventually took his own life and the interesting thing was the person who was mentoring him was another Brazilian revert to Islam so he was supposed to meet him um, a week uh, uh, that day and then the, the the brother said no no I'll meet you next week and cancelled on him last minute and then the next thing he finds out on the day that he was supposed to meet him a week later he had committed suicide. Yeah. So his his yeah. mentor was somebody from his. his actual, well, that's the his, issue his with the play, men, like yeah. his, but, So sorry, they cut it me on audio. Yeah, go for it. Go for it. So that's one of the issues I have with mentorship is that you're basically entrusting it to one person. So, you know, like you know, these, we're supposed to hold tight the, the rope of Allah, but when you help, only have one person holding that rope, you know, like uh, it's all or nothing. Whereas this in the sub community concept, you know, you have several people, you know, who mm. are there who have their own, you know, like a, uh, who have you know like a cultural community, you know, like they're inviting of everybody. They still belong to the greater umma, you know, so they're still connected in that way. Uh, but at the same time, you know, like if someone cancels, there's other people that can pick you up. You can, you know, like, you know, there's a place you can go to where you have people who've gone through the same experiences. Mm. So. Um, I briefly want to talk about because it wasn't the mentor that cancelled; it was the mentee that cancelled and rearranged. Yeah, yeah, he rearranged. It wasn't the mentor. The mentor was was regularly meeting him um, 
because obviously they were, they were nearby. It wasn't like they were miles apart. Yeah. But there was there was a regular communication with him and the mentor. But but, um, but again, that's based on the time schedule. He was the one who, yeah. who cancelled. It's, Sorry? It's based on time schedule too, right? So maybe they're like, oh, we can only meet at this time. I'm working 9 to 5 this time. So, you know, like it's based on both people's schedules. So, you know, like the more people you have helping you out, right? Oh, definitely, yeah. And more... I think this is why with the new Muslim support program, we have a mentorship mentor program to do the specific, but they always meet as a collective. So the, when we have revert classes, for example, or when we have revert uh, community socials and programs, it's with the mentors and the mentees collectively. So there's a group so that they have people that can bounce off each other in case there's any other issues. Sometimes mentors don't, you know, mentors and mentees don't get on with each other. Personality clashes, right? So it can't just be solely dependent on one person. So it has to be, you know, but the, the beautiful thing about the way that we've set it up is all the mentors are not all reverts and um, some are, some are not. Uh, and, and all the du'at are not all revert either. It's very, very mixed and diverse. The head of the new Muslim program is a revert himself of white English origin. Um, but the, the mentors themselves, we have a very specific way in which we empower new Muslims with the, the mentor program. So I think, yeah, absolutely. I think there's a, there's a community aspect to it. There's no doubt. But would I say keep it to one ethnicity only or one sub-community only? No, nah, I don't think that is, I, I, I don't think that would be the most productive way of uh, of integration and into the community. Because remember, there's a difference between assimilation and integration. They're two right. very different things. Well, yeah. What you're, what you're talking about is separation. So uh, if you look at, if you type in Barry, B-E-R-R-Y, that was a psychologist um, who created the uh, model of a culture of stress. And it's a basic two by two mm. model um, in psychology. Um, so um, the two questions you basically ask are, do you feel connected to your uh, your own community, like your your the community you grew up in, right? Uh, mm. And how willing are you willing to reach out and connect with your new community? If you answer yes to both, that's what we call integration. So, you, mm. you know, it's not one or the other. You're connected to both, right? So that's the that's the best outcome. If you have just yeah. your own community, that's separation. So mm -hmm. it's that's worse than integration, right? If you have assimilation, that's the inverse. So basically leaving your one community and coming to another one. Yeah. And that's worse than integration. Then marginalization is neither. So that's the worst outcome. <laughs> so uh, they found that with integrate people, they use this for people who came to, you know, the West who came from different countries as a measure of like, uh, you know, they measure different things like anxiety levels and blood pressure and stress and integration was always the best outcome. Right. So for converts it's the inverse. So our, you know, what is, what was the outside, the new community for them is the, the old community for us. And what is the new community for us is the old, old community for them. So um, integration is best, definitely the best outcome, but understanding what that is, is that it's not one or the other, it, it's both. So, and that's, and that's why people yeah, and have the best outcomes. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. I think that, I think that's a good, I think that's a good way of explaining it. Um, one of the things that is um, unfortunately, again, it's due to ignorance and, and lack of knowledge. Uh, and again, that cultural aspect of uh, some of the the some of the communities, in uh, and ultimately comes down to not understanding the other as well. Uh, where it, where it becomes, I've seen I've seen reverts who we haven't mentored, but we've met them later on down the line, where they've become Asianized, right? They're wearing Asian clothing, and they're you know they're, they're, they've learned Urdu and not Arabic, for example. Yeah, so they've become Asianized rather than. Uh, Islamicized, if I can use that term as well, right? Um, and similarly, you know, you have the the opposite of Europeanizing or, or Britishizing Islam, um, which can have a, a similar adverse effect as well. So yeah. it's the idea is, I think that the, the the best way for from from experience to avoid having this sort of extremism, I guess, to some extent of reactionary dawah or reacting to some of those bad experiences or reacting to um, this uh, cultural appropriation, I guess, in some regards, or assimilation, where it, beco um, it becomes almost like, and I've seen this happen as well, when there's that much division and um, separation, I guess, as well. Um, I've seen this sort of anti-Asian, anti-Arab, in some cases anti-black, and some cases anti-white anti sentiments that come 
by this by by making these divisions um and this is what we want to avoid i guess we want to avoid having those by having good intentions of having sub communities where then it eventually becomes anti this or anti that um and that's the i guess that's one of the dangers that can happen and yeah. i just want to give an example sorry jabal yeah go for it and then i'll give an, i'll give a quick example yeah, of that i can say because because um if you have a collective of people who um, may be sharing their bad experiences, um, uh, that could also become quite, um, yeah, it could create adverse kind of um, consequences um, based off of that, because obviously then their, their sort of reaction or their, their response or their feelings towards, um, you know, the, those cultural kind of uh, um, uh, massages and communities can become quite bad. So there are dangers there. I know I mentioned it earlier on, um, but that's something, obviously, Robert, as you said, you know, you, you've got your eye on the ball. So I, I think that's reassuring to know because, you know, again, you might start to get like, you know, some maybe sort of really animosity, uh, you know, people feeling a lot of animosity towards uh, their own brothers and sisters. It can become yeah. an echo chamber. Essentially, yeah, yeah. it can end up being an echo chamber. And this is the danger, I guess, um, that we want to try and challenge. And And don't get me wrong, listen, Within the I could talk about the Asian community, the South Asian community. Within our community, we have a lot of problems and a lot of ignorance, especially towards our revert brothers and sisters. I'm not going to hide it. I'm not going to shy away from that and hide from that at all. It's one of the things that we are challenging day in, day out. Um, and what we don't want is because certain perceptions and assumptions are made about the other, right? What we don't want to do is exasperate that as well at the same time. So almost becoming like you know, adversaries rather than trying to integrate and become a, a an umma and a, and a community, it can exasperate those perceptions from both sides. It's not just one side, but certainly from the south. One thing I can uh, I can talk about is some of the challenges that I face dealing with some of the ignorance, I guess, within the community. And and, the, and honestly, the the solution is. You know, the eye of the Quran, the solution is this eye of the Quran, I believe, and I believe this strongly. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Ya ayyuhaladina amanu, kunu kawamina lillahi shuhada abil qist. Or you who believe, show integrity for the sake of Allah, bearing witness with justice. And then the verse goes on to, to talk about, you know, do not let hatred for people incite you into not being just, be just. That is closer to Iman. Um, and God is aware of everything that you do. And I guess that the, the point here is, when we go back to the Qur'an, when we go back to the authentic sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ, when we go back to the Sahaba anhum, and understand Islam, how they understood it, I can, I, can, I'm, I'm, I can assure you and I'm pretty confident that the vast majority of problems that we face within our communities will be resolved. And the classic example of that is uh, the Sahaba Thumama ibn Uthal. If you study his life, and his uh, way that, that, that he came to Islam, he was very anti-Muslim, completely. He was an enemy of Islam. And he was racist as well. He was completely pro-Arab, anti-everything else, right? Um, but when he came to, when, when he got captured and was in Medina for those three days, and it was only three days it took for him, he observed the diversity of Islam while he was in the, the Prophet's mosque. He observed the way in which um, a former slave, for example, was treated with dignity and respect the same way as a noble Arab would have been, right? But because of Islam, and he makes the, he makes the comment when he, when he gets let loose and he comes back and takes the shahada, becomes Muslim, he makes the comment that, you know, from you can just imagine what he observed, the Muslims praying together, the diversity of the salah, the diversity of the way that the Muslims were treated with respect, regardless of ethnicity, social class, so on and so forth. He makes the point, he says, that in Jahiliya, in our days of ignorance, we Arabs, we would fight each other based upon tribalism. But you, O Muhammad, you have, peace be upon Allah, you have managed to, you have basically brought together and looked beyond all of these cultural permutations and united everybody upon the kalima tawheed of la ilaha illallah. And that's the most beautiful, most powerful thing that you can see, imagine that, an enemy of Islam seeing the power and beauty of La ilaha illallah uniting the diverse communities. You had Salman Farsi, Suhaib Rumi, you had Bilal, uh, and so on and so forth. 
and the power of that that it was so powerful that he actually became muslim <laughs> it opened his heart allah opened his heart that he accepted islam because of that diversity that he saw so i'm very much a big big um promoter of um you know this this diversity that the, the beauty of the diversity of islam and essentially it comes down to lack of knowledge you know it's a, a, a lack of knowledge not only of the deen but i believe lack of knowledge of knowing the other as well knowing other people's cultures and backgrounds and respecting those those sort of barriers as well well it's not that i not that i don't disagree with you i completely agree with you that like we said islam is uh is beautiful in its diversity and it's um you know one of the principles principles of the quran that um you know that uh you know like a, a muslim as a, as a brother of another muslim um i just think it's the sort of the the way forward in, in achieving that that we kind of differ on i'm saying that um you know like there are different muslim cultures all around the world um you know they're all our mother, muslim brothers and sisters um there are there are distinctions there are cultural distinctions and even uh, during, you know, the, the the Prophet's time, even though everybody was united upon Islam, uh, like, for example, you mentioned Salman al-Farisi, you know, he instructed him to translate the, the Quran into, into Farsi and to go to, uh, and to, go to Persia uh, to give da'wah to his, to his people. You know, um, you know, like the, the, the Bani Aus and Bani and the Khazraj, Khazraj, wow, uh, you know, and the one of the battles, I'm not sure which is what, but they each had their own battle flags representing each mm -hmm. clan, right? And then they, after the battle, the, the tribal little tribal leaders still remain leaders of that tribe. Um, you know, so I think, you know, alhamdulillah, Islam is great in its diversity. I just think that um, that these cultural differences are are unavoidable uh, sometimes, and it's it's a reality. I mean, these the cultural matches are always going to exist. And I think the best way forward for us to uh, to um, to, uh, to 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 heal uh, any animosities between cultures is to establish dialogue and invite each other over for iftar. Uh, you know, I'm totally a fan of cross mastered iftars, but at the same time, when you step into that mosque, you are immer immersed in that culture. And I don't think we should. Uh, and I, I think that's an important aspect of Islam that we shouldn't uh, that we shouldn't uh, get rid of. And for the convert. Like I said, we're in a totally different situation, um, and like we said, it's it's a reality that most um, people in the Muslim world um, are highly uh, endogamous, um, and you know, like uh, at, you know, like uh, and, and for many times for them, like it's not they're not they're not prepared to, for example, marry into another culture, uh, even if they're from the same country, because they feel that they're not compatible. For the convert, mm -hmm. yes, it can work. But uh, all we're saying is that it's not a panacea, and we should have that option that we should we should be able to grow uh, a convert sub community from the ground up. That way, we can give uh, dawah better to our own people. So, I do agree yeah. with you, but I just think mm -hmm. the way forward that we're trying to achieve that is a little bit uh, different. So. Mm. I think the, the I think the only the the and, and again, you know, you make some very very valid points. Um, I think some of the things that you mentioned there about the Khazraj and the Hadron flags. But you know that doesn't make it right, though. Like even the, for example, the Prophet said, "Whoever fights for his tribalism and Asabiya is not from us. He's not from no, us." I agree. And uh, so that 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 particular example you gave there, the the end part is that the Prophet rejected that. And even with the Muslim communities around the world, with their cultures, etc. Again, just because they have their particular cultures and you know dogmas and whatever else it is that they have, doesn't make it right either. There are certain practices that they have in their cultures which we reject right even if it's from our own cultures and this is why you know this is why i find quite interest when 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 i was growing up, i didn't come from a, a religious family at all um uh, and and when i was growing up um when i started practicing the religion for example one of the first things that i did when i found the sunnah of the prophet i rejected all of my culture I rejected it completely, especially the bits which were contrary to the Sunnah. And the reason why I did that was simply because I wanted to unite upon, like how the Prophet ﷺ did in Medina, unite upon the, the Kalam of Tawheed. I very sharp found out that it's not as simplistic as that, right? So there are certain things from the culture that, yep, yeah, are completely acceptable as long as it's within the confinements. That's why I said right at the beginning, 
there's certain aspects which intertwine with the sunnah and the, and the religion and certain things which will clash with the sunnah. So just because certain Muslims have certain cultural practices that they are sticking to doesn't necessarily make it right either. And uh, we shouldn't we shouldn't have, my personal view is we shouldn't have fall into that same mistake that they've made and follow in their footsteps just because they're doing it. We should have a more pragmatic approach to it um, and one that I've been using for the last 20 years, which I know works, um, of having that more diverse and open and, like you said, in integration perspective. And it's interesting because, you know, I was in um, I was in the Balkans last year. I've been to the Balkans a number of times, and it's a beautiful place. Bosnia in particular, I've fallen in love with Bosnia, I'll be honest, yeah. And I was traveling through the, the different Bosniak countries, um, and I ended up in, in Skopje in Macedonia. And I was sitting with a group of 15 scholars from Macedonia. Um, and they basically, they, they hosted me for the evening. We had a good discussion about Dawa and how things should be moved forward. And the, the interesting thing was, all of those scholars were indigenous white European scholars. And they, and I was expecting, oh yeah, I'm going to go see the scholars. I expect them all to be like, like thobes and, you know, the, yeah. the, the scarves and all that. And when I walked in, it was like, they're all wearing like, shirts and trousers and suits and stuff like one guy was wearing a suit they looked like he stepped out of the 80s yeah like with the shoulder pads and everything right and i was like whoa what about i was supposed to meet the scholars here what's going on but it was interesting because the 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 the, the, the head the head of the, the the organization he said what you have to realize is that we're indigenous european muslims and we're the only indigenous Muslim, european muslims on the continent we're not immigrants we're from here um uh, and and the interesting thing that he said was the beautiful. This is where I've learned most of this stuff from, actually from from him. The, the things I'm talking about, he didn't have this idea of having sub communities and separating and and you know and all this sort of stuff. He he was a lot more pragmatic than that. He said we've come back, we've come off the the, the back of a war in Bosnia in the 90s, um, where Muslims from all over the world came to help and support us, right? Literally from all over the world, and he said. But we, we still didn't become Arabized, Asianized, whateverized, right? He said we still held on to our identity and managed to uh, and practiced our deen based upon the Sunnah, the Prophet, Sallam, not based upon having subsets and sub communities and so on and so forth. So it was it was interesting the way that he explained it to me because that was a real eye opener for me. And and the way that he explained it was was quite interesting because he was like I said, he was coming from a perspective of understanding the nuances and the cultural context of the European Dawah. And, uh, and at the same time, he has Masajid with Turkish Imams. And, and this is in the middle of indigenous Bosnian Muslims, for example. Yeah, They have Masajid which are um, not specifically for any particular group or subgroup or ethnicity. Um, so that was the interesting thing that I found from my experience when I was there. Um, but like I said, different communities have different contexts. In Canada, you know the situation better than we know it here. In UK, we know our situation better uh, better over here. But it's interesting that whenever I travel around Europe, because I do a lot of traveling around Europe with mm. the Dawah, um, and it's uh, and it's uh, and it's it's a bit of a it's a bit of a weird one because I don't I don't hold the view that it should be only Europeans giving Dawah to Europeans only. Right? Well, I don't agree with that either. I agree. Yeah, with you. yeah, yeah. And and the idea really that agree. it's more effective or less effective, I think it's it's very debatable the whole the, the whole issue. But it's very interesting the dynamics that have that have come about from that. So, but yeah, it's Robert. It was a pleasure. It was a pleasure talking to you. Um, I'm really glad you came on. Is there any final words that you'd like to say to the audience before we wrap this show? In fact, before not wrap it up, before we hand over to uh, Jamal to give us some health advice, right? Because he's well, like in health. Uh, uh, health sure. advisor, if you like, yeah. health <laughs> advisor. <laughs> but yeah, any any final words, Robert? Before you, um, for the for the for the viewers out there, uh, I just want to wish everyone a blessed uh, Ramadan. All my uh, Muslim brothers and sisters, uh, may Allah accept our fast uh, from us uh, this year. Uh, let's keep everybody uh, safe, inshallah. Uh, let's keep uh, the good deeds going. Um, and uh, if you want to check out our website, IslamForEuropeans.com, Islam Number Four Europeans.com. And provide your feedback. Uh, we'd really appreciate it. I'm also available on Twitter. Robert of Canada uh, is my name there. But uh, yeah, I have to 
fact, I have to break my fast right now, actually. So, oh, well, uh, so I'll leave it at that. <laughs> Jazakallah khair. Thank you very much, Brother Robert, for joining us. No um, Jamal, what, and you got any final words? Any any health advice or just general advice you want to give? Just very quick. I don't know if Robert wants to leave uh, to break his fast, um, but um, uh, it's very, very quick. Basically, you know, it takes about 30 days or 40 days to create a habit, right? Um, so we're talking about trying to keep fit and have a healthy routine. Um, if you haven't been keeping up um, throughout the, this month of Ramadan, uh, Muslim BB, Gregor's, Nosko, uh, Hafsa, uh, Muslim BB, all of you, if you haven't been keeping up the routine, all the other viewers as well, um, you, you have to now try to make sure that you make an extra effort now. We're in the last 10 days of Ramadan. Um, every single day, if you can, a small token exercise of, of some form so that after Ramadan, you can continue, inshallah. So that's the thing. Create your habit and stick to it, inshallah. Uh, and don't make excuses, um, you know, which many of us do. That's the advice today, inshallah. Zakalaka. Thank you very much, Brother yeah. Jamal. Thank you, Brother Robert. Yeah. We're going to wrap it up. Yeah. 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 <laughs> we'll accept it from you, bro. So good, 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 good conversation, guys. Yes. That's the end of the show today. We'll be back tomorrow with Brother Ayaz from India, who's going to talk about Islam and Dawah in India, inshallah. So make sure you tune in tomorrow midnight, inshallah. Jazakum khair, everybody. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.